Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to join us and we'll get started in a, another couple minutes. Welcome everyone. I'm Brianne Rosner, the Gallery Director at Peters Valley School of Craft. We are so glad that you could join us today for this panel discussion concurrent with our current online exhibition, Incubation, Artists in Pursuit of Discovery. We'll post a link to the show in the chat and if you haven't seen it yet, we encourage you to spend time exploring the artwork and the statements included with them. The exhibition showcases the work of a selection of our studio assistants from over the last 10 years. Peters Valley summer assistants are an integral part of our summer workshop program, and we've seen how at times the studio experience is like an incubation experience. The show focuses on where they are now and the new directions that these artists have taken since leaving Peters Valley, and it's on view until uh, August 10th. So we're just about finished with the exhibition catalog. Keep an eye out for that next week. And I'm now going to um, turn the screen over to our executive director, Kristen Muller, who has a few words to say and will introduce our panel. Thank you, Brienne. Welcome, everyone. Um, this show, for me, um, is really close to my heart as um, someone who has learned so much from all the visiting artists when I was first learning um, after college um, and I was the studio assistant where I worked. Um, I realized how important learning with professional artists was um, and spending the last 11 summers here at Peters Valley, I have met so many incredible people. I think at least 80 studio assistants that have come through that's a lot of people when you think eight a year, sometimes more, the ones that do split shifts. Um, and, you know, to see some that are, you know, just learning their craft um, to people who have come out of school looking for their next step, spend a summer here up to 18 weeks of intense immersion with people. It's like a, an extreme human experience. It's a very uh, creative experience. They're living together, they're working a lot, and um, just getting all this input of information and to see how it starts to express itself as, as you all have developed your careers is really fascinating. Um, you all take such interesting paths and um, are always and forever connected to Peters Valley and, and, and some of the networks you've built. So um, I'm just so excited to present your conversations today. Um, I've worked with Bruce for the last 11 years, watching him as a mentor. He's been here for 20 years as the ceramics department head. So thoughtfully selecting his assistants, um, guiding them through the very intense human interactions, um, 
teaching them to not just take in and learn, but also learn to serve the community as well. So in some ways, we have this opportunity where as we're going through life, taking things in that benefit us, those moments where we're also giving back um, and making the world a better place, I think is really critical. So uh, Bruce, you've done a lot of that and helped to teach people. Um, and Bruce is going to be leading the questions and the conversations. But first I wanna introduce each panelist that's been an assistant. We're gonna start with Maddie Messinger. And Maddie was in the special topics studio and she's coming to us from Brooklyn. Um, do you wanna say a few words about what you're up to? Sure. Um, I'm currently working uh, at a, a jewelry company called Verdura. It's a luxury jewelry brand. I graduated from University of Michigan in May and started there as an intern in their archives. It's a very old business um, dating back from the 50s. So they have a really intense archive of drawings. And, and then I worked my way into sales. So like you said, everyone comes to different paths. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Anna Koplik. And Anna was a studio assistant in the blacksmithing studio after getting her fine metals degree, right? at Pratt and she's now in Temple, Texas. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Uh, well, I work as a journeyman blacksmith and just as uh, the world went crazy, <laughs> I got a job out in Texas at a Davis metal smithing, working as an architectural metal worker. So I've been out here for a few months and we'll probably be here until the world settles down a little bit. Great. Next we have Kathy. Just dress, I got it wrong, just Trepsky. Kathy was our fine metals assistant and she is coming to us from New Paltz, New York. Tell us what you're up to. Well, um, I recently completed my master's degree at Rhode Island School of Design in 2019. And since then I've been transitioning out of grad school into uh, buying a new home in the Hudson Valley, building a home studio and teaching full time across the river. I teach a fashion, textile and jewelry program to uh, high schoolers in an inner city location. And um, I can't wait to go back. I'm, I'm really missing my kids right now, but I'm lucky to be here and be safe, and I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. And then we have Max Seinfeld. Max was here as a ceramics assistant. I've known him since he was in high school. <laughs> I think you were 14 when I met you, or 14 or 15. And he is now coming to us from South Windsor, Connecticut, right? Yes, that's Max. correct. Um, hi, I'm Max, and uh, I, I, uh, I am the director of a small craft center up in the Catskills called Sugar Maple Center for Creative Arts. And I'm a new homeowner, so we're working on the studio and house now. Great. And next we have Wyatt Sievers. And Wyatt was here the first year, my first summer. And Wyatt was in the woodworking studio. And he's coming to us from Western Kentucky, somewhere between Murray and Paducah, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Tell us what you're up to. I'm working in my studio in Murray, building furniture, and um, a, a busy summer of craft school teaching all canceled, so um, painting the kitchen and working in the yard, and I am a, a recent homeowner with my partner, so we're in the early stages of studio development, and then looking at what, um, I'm part-time at a community college as a technician, so looking at what school's going to look like trying to go back in a month. Yeah. Well, That's great. It. Well, welcome. Well, Bruce, take it away. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Um, I'd like to first start off by uh, thanking Brianne, who has done a monstrous amount of work to get us to this point um, in terms of the exhibition and converting that over into an online exhibition. Um, she has put together all of the, the uh, you know, the preparations for making this panel happen and uh, for getting us together for last week's presentations or two weeks ago. There's just been an, an enormous amount of work that she has done in order to make this uh, really important exhibition happen. And, happen. and uh, it, it, as an exhibition of all of you folks' work, it, it kind of took on a very different um, 
became a different ball game. You know, it went from baseball to football pretty quick. And uh, mm -hmm. so a lot of work going into that. Um, her assistant, of course, Lakota, um, who is behind the scenes right now, but very present. And uh, she has helped a tremendous amount in terms of the technology. I want to thank all of you panelists for taking time out of your, your lives to, you know, we tend to think of this as le being less, I thought if I ever lived through a pandemic, it would be less busy. I don't know why, but <laughs> it's, it's an incredibly busy time for all of us. So it's not lost on, on me or any of us here at Peters Valley that uh, you all have taken this time to be with us and to give thought to, to um, uh, these questions that we have. Um, and, uh, and then also I want to thank the assistants who are not here right now, but who have been our assistants all of these years, 50 years, 50 years of assistance. I don't know what the number is, um, but I'm going to guess 54,373. <laughs> and uh, um, so all of the assistants who have come through this program, they are, you are our history. And um, uh, our lifeblood. And um, so this, this exhibition, this panel discussion and so forth is uh, part of our efforts to make sure that we all understand this connection that we all have as a community going forward by our shared uh, history. And then last but not least, I wanna thank the audience for joining us today. And um, the first question will be to you, and that is how many of you are wearing pajamas right now? <laughs> Um, so, uh, before I get into the regular body of questions, what I want to, what uh, my first question actually is going to be the one where I probably talk the most, I suppose, and that is, I wanted to give a context to um, what this panel discussion um, is about, what uh, we are about, and that context is the history of craft schools in America and particularly the history of Peters Valley within that, within that body politic. And, and of course, the um, craft schools in the United States got started back at the early part of the 20th century around World War I. Uh, there are a number of craft schools that actually started way back then. And then as we came into the 30s, Nazis are rising in Germany, Bauhaus is, has been happening in Germany, and some of those folks left early enough, got out of Germany and came to America and started to teach in a couple of these places. Um, they also taught at universities like Cranbrook and, and so forth in architecture and art. And, and then following the Second World War, we have the GIs. My, my father's generation came, came home uh, after seeing the world, different areas of the world during that war. And one of the things that they recognized that I've heard them talk about was that they recognized that there was something different in America. And that one of the differences here is that we didn't pay that much attention to pri proprietary knowledge. So regardless of whether you learned your craft or your art through uh, an apprenticeship program or whether you learned it through uh, the hard knocks of your studio practice or you learned it through a more formal education like in a university, there was something odd within our culture that they recognized that people who were masters at something were far more likely to share that information. And it, it happened not just in the arts and architecture, this was in every aspect of American society. So as those of us who were assistants in these programs, in these craft schools, uh, Peters Valley starting in 1970, um, as those of us who've been assistants in these, these schools over the years, we have witnessed firsthand these people, these artists, these masters, who have such an enormous amount of knowledge and they don't hold it to themselves. They don't go, oh, I can't tell you what that glaze formula is. I can't tell you how to hit that piece of steel, piece of iron with a hammer this way or whatever, because that's my information. Um, there's something really odd about that. And we take it for granted oftentimes, I think. And so one of the aspects of your legacy, those of you who are assistants, my legacy, is just that, is 
people who are willing to share with the next generation the knowledge and the information um, that they have gained from others. So pass it forward. So incubation as an exhibition and as a panel discussion and Peters Valley as a place and each of you as our panelists, um, that's your legacy. And it's super special. It is so super special. I've traveled, you know, and I've worked overseas, taught overseas. I, I really know how special that is. And um, so with that very long um, running up to my question is, is what I would like to know from each of you is to start off with is how do you process legacy? How do you process the specific legacy that has come from through P Peter's Valley as, as like a touchstone along in your careers um, and so forth. How, how do you use that in your studios or how do you use that in your communities, your neighborhoods, your families? Um, yeah, I'd be curious as to what your, your thoughts are on that. So whoever wants to go on this one first, I welcome you. I kind of want to dive into that, okay. Okay, Kathy. Um, I have thought a lot about that. Um, I remember the first time I went to Peters Valley, I was eight or nine years old. And uh, I went with my mom, who was a previous student. And Rick Marshall was in the studio at the time. And he was her college teacher in fine metal. And I just remember the impact it had on me that it was totally acceptable to pursue craft. Um, and I was so fortunate for that really young because not everyone has that opportunity. Uh, fast forward to now when I know that I have had such a fortunate education and upon leaving my student life, I really did feel very responsible to deposit all that I have gained as a student from Peters Valley, from all the craft schools that I've taught at um, to a place that wouldn't otherwise get it, you know, wouldn't uh, have access to that information, uh, which I think is really a hot topic right now is equity and access. So I just think um, Peters Valley taught me that, you know, people are generous and will share that information. And now I feel hugely responsible to do that, but also making sure that I bring it to places that wouldn't otherwise have it. So currently that's what I'm doing. And I really do attribute that, that generosity that you're talking about. Um, I learned that at Peters Valley. So I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to see where we all can bring that information and just being mindful that uh, you can make the effort to go somewhere that it might not exist already. Definitely. Thank not you. keeping the, yeah, Not keeping it a closed circuit type thing. Like, although it's in this valley and it's somewhat isolated from the rest of the world, it seems, um, you can bring what you learned everywhere. And I, like, I will tell anyone that is willing to listen about our craft school. I will like dive into any story. I'll tell, I'll tell them week by week what I did in the special topics studio. Like I cherish those stories so much. And I think about how I got there and it was because I approached one of my professors in Michigan and I said, what do I do this summer? What, what should I do? And she said, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was, I was a special topics assistant and I went on to have her exact job. I just reached out to, I think it was Brienne. And yeah, so you could say that I followed in Jessica Frelinghausen, that was her name. Um, I followed in her legacy. And like Kathy was saying, it's my responsibility to continue it. I think about like all of the blacksmiths that I learned from who were at Peter's Valley before me and working with Jake Brown when he was there. Mm -hmm. I learned things he had learned from his previous boss there, Dick Sargent, who I've still never met, but I learned through Jake things that he had been taught. And I've worked with another blacksmith, Glenn Gardner, who was an assistant at Peter's Valley back in the 70s. And so learning from him, I was indirectly learning things that he had learned from blacksmiths who had been forging you know, decades before him, and this legacy of skill has been passed through all these generations of blacksmiths through Peters Valley down to me, and then I'm going back to Peters Valley now and teaching and passing on those things that have been going for now generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love this question. Um, you know, to think about 
the people and places that influence the objects we make. We wouldn't be making them, we wouldn't be making these marks on the objects without the marks that these places and people have informed our lives. So the way, you know, and in my personal story, I assisted someone who later has now become a huge part of my life, uh, Susan Beecher, who who uh, has passed on her position at Sugar Maple Center for Creative Arts to me. And, um, you know, it's, it, I guess our responsibility or legacy is just to hopefully create these rare spaces more frequently and, and more often um, so that we can share the wealth yeah. of, of these places and spaces. That's my turn. Sure. Yeah, um, this is the best question. Um, looking back at my first time at Peters Valley, I met um, someone who became a real mentor, um, Stephen Proctor. And just that concentrated knowledge um, given to you in a week from somebody who has spent decades, um, in his case, learning in a very traditional way um, in England and just cramming that down your throat in a, in a week is unbelievable way to learn. And now that I'm at the place where I'm able to be the teacher and have the assistance, um, it's an incredible feeling. But finding like Peters Valley and craft schools was me finding um, craft and art as a, a way of making a living and a group of people that I could connect with. So I really found a way of um, uh, living there. So like to be part of the, the craft um, legacy of passing on knowledge um, is just priceless. Yeah. yeah well, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Max. No, I just, I, I loved what uh, Wyatt had said and just not only even creating a living, but creating a life. And I think we'll get into the, the questions we go into further, but yeah. uh, you know, speaking to all of these instructors we have week by week and learning how they've crafted their life around uh you know the objects they make in their life so you know that's been hugely invaluable in the legacy i guess yeah going off of that one thing that amazes me about the legacy of peter's valley is that it's like forever giving like no matter where i've gone since leaving somehow there's been this like miraculous tie um, to that place. Even if it's outside of my medium or my practice, there's this beautiful connection that keeps growing. Um, so I think that that's really special because you really can never take for granted how you may or may not meet someone randomly in a place and they might continue to guide your career along. And um, that's really also part of the legacy, that network of caring people. Mm -hmm. those are those are some real nuggets of wisdom guys i don't know yeah, we could end it right there <laughs> those those are great uh matt I, max i was just looking back on what you were saying and you were talking about mark making and uh thinking about the marks that people leave on each other you know in terms of knowledge and so forth leaving leaving the resonance of an experience and and knowledge and so forth and why at you you followed up on that with a with a uh, situation with your assistants, and I started thinking, well, all all five of you probably have assistants, and uh, on some some kind of level or another, and and so let's stay right there, and and um, and tell me a little, or tell us a little bit about what you learned at Peters Valley that has helped you in terms of working with an assistant, working with somebody who's helping you in the shop, um, what, whatever it is that you might be doing, teaching, making, whatever. Well, I'll say, I mean, there's no better place to learn how to be a teacher than a craft school where you get exposed to a different um, person every week to two weeks, seeing how they've perfected um, their teaching methods and, so the diversity of ways to communicate and connect with people um, is really priceless. Yeah. I had a lot of experience um, when I was at Peers Valley getting to do little one-on-one -on -one demonstrations and help explain something so three-dimensional and physical with words. 
and then going forwards as a teacher and managing in shops and having to have assistance and oversee people being able to communicate something that is very weird to have someone else do because it's muscle memory it was an amazing experience for me to have to build those skills while I was just starting out at Piers Valley and helped me learn the skills and the techniques better myself when I had to articulate them and get someone else to understand the same thing. For, for me, uh, I mean, Bruce, I worked with you for the whole summer. <laughs> and I think um, I, I, I have three assistants now during the summer and I just try to create the same kind of experience that you gave to your assistants. And uh, for me, you know, taking, taking last year we had three assistants from California so taking them all into New York City to see the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection of ceramics you know just uh you know even the nitty-gritty mopping the floors with them uh so I think it's it's just through my experience at Peters Valley it was oh, a life lesson on how to manage mm -hmm. Maddie do you do you have assistants do you work with Anybody? I'm an assistant. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like in an entry level position at this company. So, but Peter's Valley most definitely treated. Like I learned how to be properly treated. You know, like I could walk into any studio and whether it was a teacher or like you or any other program. You know, who, whoever's running the show, you you know how you're going to be treated in any space. So I take that with me wherever I go. Oh, that's great. Okay. Well, so um, if we were if we were flies on the wall of your studios or your brains, wouldn't that be great? Uh, what would we see with respect to how you've been dealing with the pandemic in terms of your studio practice or your thinking or your making? Um, and uh, I'm curious about how we, or in what ways this is informing your art or has informed your art. Well, I guess one thing is I knew when the pandemic hit that I'm someone who does well when they stay busy. So um, instead of putting pressure on myself as an artist to be creative in a moment that was on some days emotionally crippling. I'm sure everyone can agree with that. Um, I allowed myself to kind of use all of the experiences I had at Peters Valley outside of the metal studio to my advantage, you know? So, you know, you're there for a whole summer and you're not only focused on fine metal, you get exposure to wood or basket weaving. And actually um, I did a bunch of all of those things. You know, me and my husband, we built a garden and we used a lot of my woodworking skills from that. Or I contacted Stephen Cardi and I started basket weaving again. And uh, I kind of took the fine art pressure off and really let myself just go back to the process of craft. And um, that kind of meditative, repetitive process was really, I think, healthy um, when I wasn't able to be actively making in a more emotional context. So oh, what, when you say fine art pressure, could you describe that a little more, what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a few shows coming up in the fall and, um, you know, those obviously have deadlines and, you know, thematic context that go along with them. And initially when this kind of break happened for me from school, I thought like, I gotta get cracking, gotta get making, you know. Um, and with all of the different dynamics that were going on, some days it just felt a little heavy to be making from such an emotional place because I think I always make my art from an emotional place. But to kind of wind that a little bit more down to the basics of just a process or at least beginning back as a beginner, going back to being a beginner um, in something new just felt really healthy to me and so being able to reach out to those people I met at Peters Valley one of which was Stephen Cardi um, and just weaving baskets just felt so good and kind of stabilized me emotionally enough to kind of enter back into the the responsibilities of making my own work again I don't know if does that make sense yeah. gosh yeah that's great good yeah. Maddie um, so, so I've been in Brooklyn and I don't know about you guys, but 
being home makes me more attuned to my space and my surroundings. And I think everyone, some people have become interior decorators during this time or they take advantage of that. But in Brooklyn, you walk outside and everyone's discarding their furniture, their appliances, artwork. Um, and I kept coming across these, you know, those vintage lamps that are mosaics and glass. Um, I like kept Tiffany. finding them. Yeah, yeah, like that kind of thing. You're finding I, Tiffany out on the street. I kept, I kept finding these lamps. And I was like, this is fine. And I, I thought back to one of my favorite weeks um, as an assistant. And it was the mosaic week. And I just, I would be on a walk and I'd bring these lamps home. And then I was like, I'm just going to start crushing these and decorating my furniture with it. So I've, I've made a dresser. Um, and then I would, yeah, it, and it came out really nice. And I definitely used my skills that I learned. And, uh, yeah, you know, you find books and, like, priceless books that people are just discarding. And I use it for collage material. So the pandemic definitely made me utilize the materials around me rather than, you know, you, you can't access things right now like you necessarily could yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, my studio life hasn't really changed much um, if you are flying the wall you would see me listen to the radio probably a little too much um, <laughs> keeping up with it my governor's doing a great job though um, but my blueprints um, you know my material of furniture my blueprints were done in February so I've been working on the same thing for months and I've got a month to go but my gears are turning and it'll show up in my work my smaller sculptural stuff um, soon after this big order is finished. When you um, say it will sure turn up are you are you referring to something that you've been thinking about in terms um, of the pandemic? Not, specifically? Yeah but I haven't really it hasn't sunk into any art yet really you know they'll Maybe it'll turn into some small narrative stuff. Um, but that's one thing I love about building furniture is that I'm kind of free to just think about, um, meditate on the world and what's happening and um, and just still be practicing and craft and making something. So I don't know how much it'll, it'll show up in a, a piece of furniture, but we'll see. <laughs> I love uh, what Kat, Kathy was saying because I think she articulated something that I wasn't aware of but was experiencing. And so for myself, I, I did a series of paintings just to make up for some expected income that was lost. Uh, but in regards to my studio, I mean, I, I so admire people that can keep busy during this time because I've I have not been able to access that point. And, and I'm finally getting to a place where uh, ye yesterday I heard in a lecture um, by Chris Daly that he used the term thinking hands. And so just to be at a place where I'm turning my brain off, but having my hands work and not focusing on the product rather than uh, seeing where it takes me. So I'm up there now. Okay. Ah, huh, and what it, it just just uh, bringing in uh, different kinds of materials, or I, I'm not play now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been working in clay since May of the last year, so I, it's long overdue. Yeah. Good. Um, I guess I shouldn't. Um, I neglected to say the the pandemic has changed my uh, summer as far as I had uh, five teaching gigs at the various craft schools. So, you know, kind of rethinking that, I've been looking at my kids' program and how it could be um, a sent out package and things. So um, it's changed my thought process and that a lot. So, my uh, life mainly changed because I ended up much more stationary than expected. Um, I tend to travel a lot for work and I had a lot of teaching gigs, gigs planned as well that were all canceled and ended up in a rural place somewhat isolated working and living at a blacksmith shop and my life became even more living and breathing work than it has been since working at a craft school mm. and it's just me and a bunch of other 20 somethings who are my co-workers they all live together and I work and then I go spend my free time working on whatever I want and yeah. I've been able to focus um, probably in a way I wouldn't have been able to 
because there's nowhere else to go. There's nothing else to do. It's just me and a power hammer. So I might as well work and make whatever my heart desires. Which is mm -hmm. a very amazing place to be. Yeah, do you have people coming and going from the shop? I remember seeing the shop last week. You gave us a little bit of a tour of it online. Um, yeah, not really. Um, my boss and his family live here and all of my coworkers are somewhat similar to me doing journeyman work and moved out here. We have a bit of a, a trailer park going on in the behind the shop and we all have a weird little family that we started. Mm -hmm. We all cook our meals together. We work wow. together. We inspire each other with what we're going to make and it's become a really amazing uh, inspiring family space. Oh, wow. That is super interesting. Yeah. Kathy, were you going to say something there? Or? No, I was just thinking that that's really beautiful. Yeah. It's such a beautiful oh. kind of replication of what happens at Peter's Valley. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Um, well, so let's, let's talk about your work a little bit. Um, the work that you're currently doing and, and, and you might want to refer back to the work that you were doing when you were assistants in the program. Um, and what that distance uh, looks like physically with respect to the work, um, aesthetically, conceptually, um, that kind of thing. Could you tell us um, uh, something about the issues that are most important for, for you that you're working with currently? And if there's a connection to work that you were making back when your assistant's here, or if, or if you've just gone on a total different divide and, and, and gone somewhere else with that. So. Um, let's see, Anna, would you like to start on this one? Um, sure. Um, I mean, I become primarily a tool maker, um, and there aren't really many issues behind tool making. There's not much meaning other than I love making things that I need, and I love the functionality of it. Um, but I did first learn about tool making when I was at Peters Valley. When I was first there, I was really excited about weaponry and bladesmithing. That's how I first got into blacksmithing and learned how to make my first hammer, my first pair of tongs while I was there. And that's what I love doing now. And I'm informed by what I need and by what challenges me in the process. Um, the other thing I've started to explore um, since being at Peters Valley is more delicate forgings. Um, and the idea, I didn't even realize at first why I was doing this. And then eventually realized that I wanted to incorporate femininity into blacksmithing. And the idea that everyone saw it as this very like brute force um, technique and craft and world and coming from a jewelry background, I realized I could mm. take something very strong and immovable and intimidating like steel and make tiny, delicate, refined work. And that is something that continues to really excite me. And I'm still trying to figure out ways to blend that in with everything that I do. Anybody else is welcome to go. Um, well, I'd say like Peter's Valley wasn't really a turning point for my work because I was lucky to be there so early. I was still at the very beginning of it. Um, but, you know, I, I came there with the uh, furniture knowledge and really got turned on to turning and I've gone on to do just, I don't know, a lot with that. Um, so, yeah, but I definitely like being at the craft school, seeing all the different media has influenced me and uh, bringing in some metal smithing into my furniture. And um, mm. I have a book binding studio in my basement now because of the people I meet at craft schools. Um, so um, it's informed me the whole way, just um, that connection and keeping in tune with the conversation um, of going out to the craft school and being inspired by all the different medias and then coming back to the wood shop and making it in like having a, a wood thought based on something I've discovered out there. Okay. So, so if you were to, 
If you yeah. were to take a, an example of your work um, uh, right now, one of your more, more recent pieces, and you were to think about or describe for us what it's, what it's about, mm -hmm. uh, if there's something beyond the, beyond the function, um, the, how would you describe that? What, how might you? Well, I mean, it's all about comfort for me right now because I'm working on a set of chairs and making okay. sure they're not too tall to block the mountain view, but yet give the back the right support. Um, and yeah, just uh, um, a fine function. And But they're also a tactile thing that you pick up and carry around. So um, that's being taken into consideration and there's a little bit of metal work on that. So these guys are, they have hinge, hinges and things like that, so they can pull. Um, just uh, some attachments um, being bolted together, allowing flex and things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Kathy, how about you? Uh, I would say similar to Wyatt, when I was just exiting um, my undergrad degree at New Paltz, I was really... I, I guess looking back, it feels like just the beginning. I was using a lot of fine materials. I was uh, apprenticing uh, for a goldsmith who I still work for now. And um, my, I, after assisting for Nash and seeing some of Nash's alternative work in ferrous metal, uh, I was really excited by ferrous metal. And also, um, all of my work right now is totally ferrous. I don't use anything fine really at all. Um, I've done a lot of work with ethical metalsmiths on material mining. Um, so the combination of all of those things has heavily impacted my work. So looking back, my work was fine and delicate. Um, and I've really tried to maintain that fineness of goldsmithing in ferrous material, kind of like what Anna was talking about. So maybe we should do a collaboration, but, um, yeah, now I'm really interested in uh, working class identity and how that meets trade and craft. And that's what all of my work is about. Uh, I usually interview tradespeople and craftspeople who do that for a living and showcase the um, importance of craft and trade in this country um, under a politically tumultuous kind of... Uh, time. I don't know how to yeah. preface it, but yeah, just trying to kind of separate and make sense of the preconceived notions that get placed on tradespeople during this political season that um, are not always accurate. So I use my work um, jewelry specifically to do that. You know, it's interesting when I was reading all of your, your bios um, uh, before we went on, um, I saw this ethical uh, what is ethical metal smithing, ethical that you're, that you're talking about. And I was like, oh, I've got to remember to ask Kathy about that. How, can you tell us just a little bit, it's an organization and how does it work? So Ethical Metalsmiths is an organization. It has a board. Uh, they have a pretty strong online presence that's governed uh, by many people. Susie Gonch is one of the leading people. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they do a bunch of different things. They recently had a big educational um, kind of convention at New York City Jewelry Week where they were bringing together people who are bringing news about ethical mining and um, sourcing gemstones and how to use and recycle metal properly. So they have educational conventions like that. And then they also do Radical Jewelry Makeover, which is more of like a creative recycling workshop, maybe something, I don't know if uh, Peters Valley has held a radical jewelry makeover, um, but they usually come to craft locations or educational spaces and um, teach students how to recycle material and recreate things, um, art from pre-existing objects. Mm. Uh, but I just feel really passionate about it. And I think um, many jewelers and metal workers come to the table of pre-made material and they don't really realize how it got there. Uh, but when you start digging, it's really, it's really startling and uh, problematic and lots of little kids are involved and you would never know. So once I got hooked, um, I've just been working with them on different materials and different initiatives. So Great. I highly recommend Great. checking it out. Great, thanks. Who, who's, who's left to talk to us? Yeah. yeah, Maddie, go ahead. 
So when I was at Peter's Valley, I still had a large chunk of my college career left. And that summer was such an eclectic, in the Special Topics studio, such an eclectic collection of crafts. And I kind of haven't stopped that kind of energy in my own life. And I felt so moved by assisting different artists there that that informed the way that I perceive my education going forward. So I've gone on to intern with a bunch of different artists and different mediums. Uh, Chico McMurtry was a, he's a uh, robotics uh, artist. I helped him at Michigan. I assisted Kiki Smith, a printmaker. Um, I did an internship in London uh, uh, at a house, uh, at a house of a fashion called Zandra Rhodes. Um, she's one of the last uh, screen printers in London or in the world that has the type of uh, hand screen printing technique that goes on in her basement. So I lived with her for two months. So it's just been, my practice has kind of been throwing myself into other people's practices, like in at the stage that I'm at. And I can't think of a better way to learn that way and to meet these people and be immersed, not even in their, not even just their art lives, but their personal lives too. Like I, I don't know, that, that's just like how I've been going. And now I've settled at a more nine to five kind of situation, but it's heavily design based and uh, like history has always been a link in my work. So I don't see how the two separate in the position I'm in now. So mm. when you yeah. say it's it's design based, could you describe that for us? What what do you yeah. mean? So uh, so Folco di Verdura, he came the the artist that I work on, his, the brand that I work under, he came from Italy, Sicily in uh 1945. He traveled to America like right, right during the war and he mm. launched this uh he la launched this jewelry uh company because one of his, his main client was Coco Chanel. Chanel had all the, this jewelry that she got from her, her men over the years. And if she said that it didn't fit her style, so he helped her redesign this jewelry. And then it went on to become his personal brand. And he was, uh, you know, outfitting all of these socialites in New York City. So oh, he was actually taking pieces of jewelry that somebody else had made and yeah. reconfiguring them and yeah these dukes huh. I can't give you the I can't remember the the specific names but like a duke of Russia she dated and she would get all this lavish jewelry and she's like this doesn't go with my style and he completely deconstructed it and made it his own <laughs> these crazy gemstones and he yeah so so now this archive exists of over 10,000 drawings and we still pick and choose out of those existing drawings and now realize them into actual jewelry like he's been dead since 1975 and the company's kind of flipped over hands since but yeah kind of just like being immersed in that history and being able to sell it today it's just it, i find it really fascinating work hmm. yeah wow great thank you any let's see who else did we miss somebody on that one I think we're good. Um, Max, did we? Yeah, you you went. Um, so I'm thinking about I'm thinking about uh, the next question has to do with the challenges that all of us face as, as artists, and um, and there those those challenges are you know there are as many of those things as there are artists, and so um, but. As far as the pandemic, of course, the pandemic is really heavy on my mind with respect to the to challenge and, and how that's affecting affecting us. There are artists out there who who could very well be benefiting, you know, during this period of time, and there are artists who are really getting hurt by it and and so forth. So, um, I want our imaginations to be um, open to whatever possibilities there are. But I would be really curious as to how you view your greatest challenge what is your greatest challenge right now as a as an artist and um and i think that's something that i'd like to hear from all of you what and and how are you dealing with that you know more importantly is is what you're doing with that yeah so let's start with uh wyatt you want to go first on this one sure. um well yeah i did just like to have the entire timer canceled though um, it's been just kind of 
trying to live really cheap and wait for the semester to start back up and fingers crossed that that is happening, which it is. Um, and then I've been doing, um, or just now starting to do some programming at my studio at my art guild where we're set up outside on our mini lays and um, we wear masks and have our own tools and things basically the entire time anyway. So I've been fortunate to move forward um, with that possibility. And um, yeah, I'm just looking at how I can do my classes remotely um, for kids and finding, you know, I'm someone who has done a lot of my commissions and things word of mouth, getting out and um, meeting clientele directly. So I'm a little bit of a dinosaur. So I'm waking up to get more of an online presence and working on that um so okay um, i'm figuring it out but it's good so far yeah yeah i think for me um you know there's a to be completely transparent there's a huge financial stress um i i you missed me on the last question but what has differed in my studio practice from peter's valley is that it's part-time administration and uh, working towards a summer program that was just annihilated. So, um, you know, to then translate that time and space into the studio, um, you know, it's a huge shift. Um, so, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to get over. Get yeah, Max, is it too early to ask? You know, you're saying that you're that you're just getting back into the studio. So going back to the previous question where I, I omitted you, uh, my apologies. Um, is it too early to talk about what, you know, some of the ideas that you're working with in terms of the new stuff? Or? Yeah, it's early, but I'm okay talking about it. It's, uh, you know, for a long time, my work was process driven. That's how it was at Peter's Valley. I didn't really make any work at Peter's Valley. I spent that time talking to the instructors and just kind of being a fly on the wall. Uh, and, and now where I am in the studio, I had a really important person pass away kind of just suddenly last May. And so I, I've been thinking about communication and, uh, and writing letters and that's become a part of my practice. And so now I'm trying to translate that into some ceramic objects. Mm, interesting. And so what to, tell us a little bit about the challenge that you see going forward in terms of, of uh, sugar maples. Uh, well, well, I think there will be some challenges and just, you know, that you'll face this, that we'll all face, you know, even outside the craft school, just thinking about, um, you know, how to restructure the classroom. Uh, but on a personal level, it's a, you know, we're on season during the summer. So the off season, we dive right back into programming. So, so that, so that I'm jumping right back into that, but uh, there's a huge reality to what we do as artists financially. Like, how am I going to pay my bills? Um, you know, do I want to make sacrifices in the studio to pay those bills? And, um, or do I want to go and get a job at Trader Joe's? And, <laughs> on what I want to do in the studio. Thanks, Max. Anna, how about you? Um, I'd say my biggest challenge is the same as it's always been, uh, figuring out a balance in my life between my paying job, which is still, you know, metal working and blacksmithing related, and then figuring out how to have time and energy to then after work, keep going with metal work. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's different because it's often different processes. It's something I'm excited about making versus something that I'm making for someone else. But, you know, it can be, um, it can be difficult to finish working. You're tired, your body's sore and than to go grab a snack and go right back to the exact same thing, but on your own time for your own, you know, own purposes. And I have to, you know, remember to give myself breaks and that's okay if I don't want to go back and keep forging or keep grinding or whatever it is, but also, 
you know, set goals for myself of, you know, I want to make this specific thing or I want to learn this process and hold myself accountable, which um, at times is more difficult than others. Great, thanks. Maddie, did you? Um, yeah, I, I would just say that malleable at this time. It's obviously a torturous time for so many people. Um, and just if, you know, if your art crafting world isn't working, then find creativity in other things. Make yourself a beautiful meal. I feel like that's something I've been doing a lot of cooking and I find it therapeutic in this time. Um, and, and like Max was saying, keeping in touch with friends, I think communication is very important right, right now to check in with your people. Um, you can find a lot of strength doing that and you can feel isolated in a lot of ways. And I think uh, that's definitely key during this time. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, we're, we're at three o'clock, but I'm, I've got to ask this one question um, because it, uh, it comes from my interest in psychology. <laughs> and the question is, is um, if you were both psychologist and you, if you're both characters in this little one act play, um, you're the artist on the couch, what would be the most important question for that psychologist to ask you, the artist, that might give us some idea about why you make the objects that you make? Mm. Mm, that's a great question. Yeah. Basically every day. <laughs> <laughs> Therapy every day. Um, I don't know, eeny meeny. Uh, Anna, you want to start that one? Oh no, let's have Max start this one because I, I skipped Max at one time. <laughs> this is actually the one question that I was hoping would not ask me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh good. Yeah, if I was the, the therapist and the artist, yeah. And the question that I Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. I uh about my work or about myself. That's the I I I don't know. Well Anna Anna kind of jumped forward there pretty quick when I said Anna. She looked like she was she had it had it happening. So let's go back to Anna. Okay. <laughs> Um, I kind of had the same feeling of like, oh, I don't know. Um, I guess not necessarily why do I make what I make, but like, why do I live the life I decided to live? I think, mm -hmm. I think about this a lot of, you know, I decided to give up, at least for the time being, any semblance of a stationary home or consistent time spent with friends and family and focus completely on just traveling and making and like, why do I do that? Mm. And I, I don't have an answer. Um, and it's something I hope to one day figure out about myself. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep doing it because it feels right. Yeah, good. That was great. Kathy, you want to go? I'm thinking, um, I guess a question I might ask myself is how does, how is teaching just as much of my artistic practice as making, um, is a question. I mean, I, I know that they're so tightly connected to one another. Um, and since I didn't speak on the last one, I was just thinking about you know, the challenge of balancing also like teaching full time and working now at the goldsmith for the summer and balancing all of that as kind of a security policy, you know, just trying to be financially safe during this time to the best of my ability and balancing that with actually having time to make work. But um, in some ways, I feel like as long as I'm teaching or even like working as a goldsmith, I guess I feel like I am still living my artistic identity anyway. Like I feel like those are integral to the whole thing going around. So when I get to make, I guess it's a luxury um, and I hope to get there in the near future now that things are calming down, but um, making in any capacity is good. 
Yeah, that's really that's so important, isn't it? I mean, it's so important for the art for artists to be able to um, to get that going, that part of ourselves going in whatever we're doing, mm. no matter where we're working, no matter what we're doing. You know, um, yeah. When I when I teach, you know, I you know I try to come up with projects that um, that I feel are actually works of art. You know what I mean? Totally. And, um, so that's that's kind of part of that invention thing. Wyatt, how about you, psychologist asks, what's uh -huh. the most important question? Well, I'd probably leave it just wide open to interpretation and ask myself why. And um, I would go straight to why do I make art? And it's to um, have a, a sense of purpose and do I create something that is Mm -hmm. Now in the world, that's going to create a story with everybody that interacts with it. And just to like, I, I do it to uh, like pay homage to the ability to take material and make things that serve thought and function. And um, that's why I do it. Um, just uh, have fun and like pass some knowledge along. Be part yeah. of a good community. Amen. Uh, your psychologist would just go, you're, you're totally sane and fine. Go ahead and leave the check with the secretary. <laughs> he, he Maddie, not, how about you? What? Um, I would ask my, the question, um, what elevates an object to a talisman? Oh. A lot of my work, uh, as you can tell with the lamps, it centers around finding things in the world and then uh, transforming them and presenting them as something new. Uh, like my final year project in college, I was gifted a typewriter from one of my professors. And then I did this year long project of leaving a typewriter in public and having people write about, talk about psychology, have people write about their relationships with their mothers oh. on the typewriter. So I, and then I collected all this data and then made this final piece. It was like a installation typewriter through a wall kind of thing with a roll of paper coming out with all these responses. So uh, something in there, I'm very interested in what people have to say and, and that collection aspect. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, let's see, Max, shall we revisit? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You don't wanna talk about the couch, Max? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, you guys, that was fantastic. I love that. I love this conversation with you. I, you know, I wish we could go on until, well, until there are burgers and, and beer available <laughs> at the bar. <laughs> if, yeah. Before we end, if I could just add, this wasn't necessarily a question you asked, Bruce, but um, without, I mean, to sum up what I've been kind of speaking about, but without my time at Peters Valley, I wouldn't be where I am today or making the objects that I'm making. It was a place that offered, uh, I mean, so much. And so I'm just so grateful to you guys and thank you for inviting me. But. Oh, thanks for participating, all of you. Thank you very, very much for being part of this. Thank you, we've got a couple questions that if, um, uh, if, if people are interested um, and might wanna answer, um, I, I before I, I do want to say something in closing, but I don't know, Brienne, do you want to ask the question or should I? You can. Feel okay. free. Mustafa Yassar asked um, about a half an hour ago, what does Peters Valley remind you of? Does it pull you in a specific time, like ancient, medieval, early modern, or modern? And how and why does it shape what you create? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think it feels like when it was founded in 1912 or whatever, or, or 1970, but you, you talked about how craft schools were, you know, at the turn of the century. I don't know. I just, I have this wild memory of walking down and someone was, some woman was excavating these pots in front of the Peters Valley sign. And oh, I was the, just like, the architect, the archaeologist. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Like I've never seen anything like that in my life. And yeah, it's a special place. I don't know if you could put a specific time period on it, honestly. It's, yeah, I, I don't know if I would. Oh, I'm sorry, Wyatt. 
Oh, I was saying it is a time bubble where you kind of, you step out and you're, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what time period we're in there, but we're definitely outside of the world and kind of viewing it. Um, why we're just digesting it and creating. And so it's timeless. That's what time period it is for me. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think of a time period, but I think and reflect on the time in my life that I was there. And uh, when in preparation of this, I was just thinking this uh, Joan Didion quote on to be on nodding terms with the people we used to be, um, lest they come and settle some things at 4 a.m. hour of the soul. And, and I, I really love that quote because you know, I look at all the pictures that I took during my time there, and it was such a more innocent self that was back there. And um, and so, yeah, I don't think of a time period in history, but uh, collectively, but maybe per more personal. Mm. And I think that happens for the students that come to Peters Valley as well. Uh, you know, it, it's so rare that we see a space created where people can create. Um, you know, outside of their workplace job. Yeah. Or just, I think we live in a society that kind of condemns slowing down. Not that what we do at Peters Valley is slowing down, but in a way it's dissecting what we don't know. Like I, I was a kid when I went there. I did never even considered what it was to forge a knife. Like Sam Smith, I think his name was. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Sam uh -huh. Um, yeah, it just, it blew my mind. Like, I, I think, I tell people, like I said, I, I'll tell anyone who will listen about the craft school experience because I don't think enough people understand how things work. Yeah, I think that I, instead of a time period, I do feel like there is a slowness. I was going to say that. I feel like I, every time I go to Peter's Valley or even drive through it, I just, like, my, my mind slows down and I feel a, a really strong sense of wellness in my mind because I give myself permission for whatever reason when I'm there to just focus on on what I'm doing and empathize with material in a in a way that I don't get time to do so um, yeah I think that's the most special thing is that slowness thank you I, I just I'm want to say thank you so much for taking the time to join this conversation. Bruce, your questions were fabulously provoking. And um, you're all such wise young artists. And, you know, you hold our future. And, and it gives me a lot of hope. And um, don't, don't let this virus get you down. Because there is a future. We're going to shape it. And Artists always have put a remarkable effort into what they do. So even if you have to eat a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to buy your materials, it's worth it. And if you have to work at night or on the weekends, take it from somebody who has a pretty busy job and I still manage to squeeze in my artistic practice. It is absolutely worth it. It will feed your soul. It will inform everything that you do in your professional work or work you do for hire. And um, the idea that it's two separate things is I think a myth when we talk about life work balance, it's actually a balance because we spend a lot of time at work, right? And, and our coworkers are like our family. So um, I think every bit of integration that you can bring your creativity to every bit of your practice um, is exciting and I I personally think about designing design thinking when it comes to Peters Valley when it comes to your experience as assistants the student the instructor designing programs uh, you know like this is and I, I push a lot of paper here too right it doesn't seem that creative but it's an extremely creative um, project and Peters Valley um, it's a really special place and you guys really brought tears to my eyes, even just with the first question. And I thought, Oh my God. So I'm sending you a virtual hug. Thank you all. Hugs. <laughs> Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you everybody. all. This was That's an incredible great. conversation. And um, Thank you, we're Brian. so appreciative of everybody 
that came together for it. And um, I'm really glad that we can share it on our YouTube channel so that everybody that has those jobs um, can tune in later and, and hear from all of you because what, yeah. what an incredible conversation. So thank you. Yeah, great fun to see all of you again. You too, Bruce. You, you, haven't, you haven't aged a day. <laughs> Hide it all. Hide it all. All right, take care. Everybody stay safe. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.